Hi, everybody. Welcome to Act Now. I'm Juliana Forlano. Happy to be with you here today. We're going to process a little bit about what I've seen since the leaked document from SCOTUS showing that they are poised to knock down and get rid of Roe v. Wade. So we're going to talk a little bit about the shock. Everyone is shocked. Everyone is shocked. Why are we so shocked? We clearly have not been paying attention to this particular issue if we are shocked because providers and advocates across the board knew this was coming. I do think, you know, it is a little shocking to watch the Supreme Court of the United States capsize like a giant Titanic to, um, you know, illegality to um, religious Ide ideology as opposed to being, you know, uh, 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 an organization under the rule of law. We're going to be looking at what's happening in the streets in D.C. Then we're going over to Twitter and a little bit of TikTok to look at what is happening online. I picked some of my favorite online uh, responses to this. Then we have Heidi Seek from Vote Pro Choice coming on. She is She's been on the show before. She is uh, Vote Pro Choice is a sister organization for ACT TV, as you might know. And she is going to give us, you know, kind of the bird's eye view from the activist perspective for, from people who have been in this fight for a long time. All is not lost. So let's calm down. We should be excited. We should be protesting. We should be out in the world. We should be turned, you know, having our lights turned back on to what we are facing in terms of the march of tyranny in the United States, especially, of course, over women. But we should not give up all hope. And Heidi's going to tell us what we can do. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a little history lesson that as I was looking, I'm going off to Italy for a little while this summer. And as I was looking into my travel plans, I noticed that a woman's lack of choice has been with us forever. And I'm going to give you a little example of that for fun. So this is our show for today. First up is our action rundown. He was live in the streets in D.C. yesterday. I have a bunch of interviews that our good friend and host of The Pursuit of Happiness right here on Hack TV, Jocelyn McCurdy-Keats, was on the scene interviewing some folks. So let's get straight to it. I have a couple of things that I would like to run. But f first, I want to I want to just tune your ear to the fact that almost everyone that was interviewed and our interviewer, Jocelyn, talked about how shocked they were. Now, yes, everyone was shocked because it was a leaked memo. And I go on later in the show to talk to Heidi Seek about how uh, this, it was better that it was a leaked memo because it slapped everyone across the face in a giant wake-up call, as opposed to if the Supreme Court had just started talking about the case um, that this decision was the, you know, was it was going to be the the what they put out on, you know, people would have started talking about it in the news. You would have a ramp up. You would be a little bit upset. Then you'd be more upset. Then you'd be fully disappointed when the court struck down your right to bodily autonomy. But it wouldn't be this massive slap in the face. So if the shock is coming from this unexpected slap in the face in this policy area, great. But if it's coming from not knowing this was a possibility, problem. Okay, so we're going to take a look at our first, let's take a look at uh, Jocelyn's first interview. These women are fantastic, the women who came out to protest. Maddie. My name is Trinity. Okay, and I see, I've seen you guys out here for a couple hours now, right? How long have you been here? Probably like two hours, probably. Yeah, a couple hours. It kind of died down a little bit when we first got here, but then obviously like the other group of people came back, so it's back up. But yeah, about two hours. So... Obvious question, what brings you out here today on this fine, fine Wednesday afternoon? Well, obviously, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a feminist, so I'm out here fighting on behalf of women's rights to get... I love how she's like, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a feminist. Well, if you're a woman, you should be a feminist, hopefully. But 
That's not always the case since religion has convinced us against our own best interests in some cases. Anyway, here she goes. Safe abortions. Um, what about you? I just think I'm out here today because it's something that's important to me and I want to be someone who's about my word and I'll do things about my beliefs. But I just think it's a very fundamental thing and it's sad to see this being overturned in the way it is. Uh, how did you both feel when you got the news on Monday night? I, I keep telling people I felt surreal. It was bizarre. Yeah, I mean, I was really shocked because I honestly wasn't... Shocked! Everyone is shocked! Anticipating that Roe versus Wade was could be overturned. Um, and then immediately I just got really angry because it's not that these people believe really like that abortion is wrong, but they just want to put their religion in politics where it doesn't belong. Yeah, I would say I felt similar. I was a little more disappointed, but not surprised. Because I mean, for me, like I've been paying it. Like there've been a couple bills passed that, like, by people that say they're pro-life, but they don't support pro-life things. Like there was a bill passed. It had to do with kids incriminating themselves and not being able to consult their parents or a lawyer before speaking with the police. And that is just not pro-life. Because what if they self-incriminated on accident and the kid is therefore put in danger? So I think the pro-life thing is kind of bullshit in that sense because it's so hypocritical and you want to pick and choose when you use beliefs like that. And I feel the same way with religion, the picking and choosing when it works for your belief system, but then you want to disregard all the other stuff. I think it's really hard to take people seriously when they're hypocritical in that way. Well, I heard someone, uh, the New York Times podcast hope say this morning that this is the first time the Supreme Court has ever overruled a precedent to create less liberty. <laughs> Normally when they overrule a precedent, it's like, okay, maybe we should not be racist. Yeah. Maybe women should own property. I don't yeah. know. Exactly. Yeah. And this is well, I find it kind of funny because I think that it's the exact same people who are saying that they're pro-Constitution, who are the same people who are trying to overturn Roe versus Wade. So it calls into question, are they really pro-Constitution or are they only pro-Constitution when it benefits them and only them? Yeah, I would agree it's a major step back in a lot of ways because I think like we were hoping with the change in presidents like things would shift a little bit more forward and I would not blame the president for all those things because some of those things he are not up to his control but I think it's a big step back for that movement and it's a disappointing one at that. Well, so what, what do you both plan on doing next? Like, you know, you're young women and I've been pointing this out, a lot of the women here are very young, you're like students, you know, and these... Your mothers have this right. Your grandmas might have even had this right. Like, how does that feel? It just honestly feels like, like she said, we're really just going back in time. And it's so disappointing because recently it seems like so many things have been put into place that is benefiting people. For example, like legalization of recreational marijuana. I feel like that's a really good step forward. And it just seems when it comes to things that involve women, people are very hesitant. They're very hesitant to be modern and they think it's being traditional but it's not being traditional it's being oppressive and you're just being bad people to be oh i love it it's not being traditional it's just being oppressive that is kind of traditional pro-choice isn't pro-abortion but it's just being able to say you know what girl you got your own life i got mine my nose is not going to be in your business i really like that yeah, I agree. I would, we were talking about that on the way here. I just think it's like a sad step back because really and truly, like I've seen like the posts about it that say like it's not, it's banning safe abortions. And it makes me sad because you know what desperation does to people, especially in situations like that. So it's going to be scary. And I just hope as a nation, if this is what goes through, like they are prepared to deal with the consequences of it because it's going to be like a steady, but a big impact to things like that. And it makes me sad. Are, is this our youth? Are these the women who are going to come up and take power? I certainly hope so. I mean, they were fabulous. We have another uh, video of uh, Jocelyn doing some interviews. But you can see, like, the shock is... The one woman was like, I'm not too shocked because I've been following this issue. But um, the shock is kind of palpable across the board. Let's play the second, um, the next one, Giancarlo. What brings you out here today to state the ass obvious? Well, uh, I found out about this. Um... Late when on, two, on Monday night, on Monday night when the decision came out, and I texted my friends that night, and I said we need to come and do something. We go to school in Baltimore, so uh, I got about ten of us to come out, and we've been here all day. We want to stand up for reproductive rights of all women. How about you? Same thing. Are you guys from Baltimore? 
Texas and our abortion rights have been under threat for so many years because of Governor Greg Abbott and Republican lawmakers. And I just think that abortion doesn't stop when you outlaw abortion. It only outlaws safe abortions. And I think that we need to be protecting women and women's like right to choose rather than telling women what they should be doing with their bodies or putting them in dangerous situations. Well, and what it says about how this country thinks of women in general, right? I don't think anybody wants to have an abortion. It's never a pleasant experience. No, and this morning, this group was on my college campus, like, protesting the doctor who carried out the late-term abortions in D.C. And, like, the fact of the matter is no one wants to have an abortion, but no one wants to have a late-term abortion. And so the fact that they think that these women are, like, intentionally choosing or, like, wanting this decision or, like, wanting to, like, hurt whatever they consider to be these children is really sickening because it shows you how little they value life that's already around. And it's like, we don't have health care, we don't have child support, we don't have good public education like maybe you should be fact like working on fixing like birth control and sex education and factors that contribute to women having abortions and trying to outlaw abortion well, we were just speaking with another young woman here about that if you really valued women if you really were like you know what abortion is traumatizing for families right. and women we would be investing in education health care yeah. child care Right, and you, you support privatized foster systems that are already overcrowded. Most of those children end up, you know, in like in drug abuse or without, you know, like rehab facilities, or they'll end up, you know, in the incarceration incarceration system, which is already overcrowded in Texas. Like you're just putting yourself into more trouble with all of these people that already exist, and so you only care about unborn fetuses, and you don't care about the people that are actually here. It's infuriating. Yeah. That's well said, Jocelyn. <laughs> it is infuriating. It's infuriating. I was shocked by how stunned I was when I got... Shocked! It was funny, because she said she was shocked by how stunned she was. Yes. And, you know, she already... Jocelyn works here at ActTV, so she already knows exactly what's been going on, but the shock was still there. The news was just right. shaking. And so for the people who aren't here, could you... And I've been asking everyone this. Could you describe the vibe to people at home? Oh, it's so friendly. Everyone here is so kind and so supportive. I met so many amazing and supportive women and men today and people of another gender. Um, everyone has just been so supportive, so you like so unified. If you need water, you ask for water, you get water. It's kind of that vibe today. And everyone should try to go to a local protest. If it's not here, in your hometown, mobilize, volunteer, and please go vote. I also, yeah, like I said, they were on my college campus this morning, and the vibe here and there was great. Like, people are doing their part to, you know, kind of silence the harassment. Like, women who have had abortions are being called murderers, or women who support choice are being called these horrible names. So, like, this morning when they were... They were also being arrested, depending on what state you're in. They were writing stuff on the sidewalk. Everyone brought out their Brittas and, like, poured water on the sidewalk. Or, like, when we're out here, like, people are, like she said, are, like, passing out water, are being supportive. And so I feel like 70% of this country wants abortion, whether you're in a red state or a blue state. It's 70% of the country. And I think it really shows because this group is really looking out for each other and really making sure that, like, we see the support, not just in, like, words, but also in actions, like, donating to local abortion funds. If you're watching, please go donate to a local abortion fund, not Planned Parenthood. They're well-funded. Please go donate to, like, a red state. Um, That's and true. Also just kind of looking out for each Good other point. in a way that makes sure that people feel like heard and feel like their voices are heard even when we're under attack. You all are wonderful. How long are you planning on being here? Where do you go to school? I, go, I just graduated GW. Well, I mean, today was my last day of college, so I'm fighting for my rights today. I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg would be proud, so I just finished my final and ran over here. Well, congratulations! Thank you! Thank you. Um, uh, but if I didn't have access to birth control or, like, a safe, you know, like, abortion facilities, odds are, like, I wouldn't have made it to school. I've never had an abortion, but I know so many women who have had that issue before, and they've had to drop out. And I just think that... Um, yeah, so I, I go to GW and I... Have you ever heard of a guy who's like, oh, I'm going to be a father. Now I have to drop out. Oops. It does feel like there are a lot of very young women. Yeah. Or really yeah. old women. We were talking yeah. about this. We were just talking about All the this. women that we've met are either our age or women or, or, or 80. 80. Well, I, yeah, because 
the the middle we need you there young women and we need you there older women who've been fighting this forever uh because we're at work i can't just run down to dc from here so um yeah not that you don't have jobs or whatever but we really need you if you have the time to please show up because for every person that's there uh, you know, there's like a hundred thousand who wish they could be there. Also yesterday, I think that it was like, I think the number was 10,000 people or something like that. This is the next day. Uh, people just really coalesced around this issue, uh, in DC. And I don't think this fight is going to end anytime soon. Although I did notice that on the internet, it has been obscured by other things. Joy Behar saying she's going on a Lizzie Strata sex strike. Um, or maybe just not saying she is, but encouraging the rest of us to do that, that to use our sexual power to push this over the edge. Yeah. So, like, a lot of these women that come back out here are shocked that they have to even come back out. Again, shocked. Um, That's interesting. She said, I don't know if you heard it, but she said a lot of the older women who, um, are out there are shocked that they have to come back out. But I mean, I think it's time to get over being shocked. I think we need to really open our eyes and be aware that what is happening is the fall of democracy. I mean, there's no, the, we knew this would happen when Trump appointed three appointees who were religious zealots in one way or the other, or ideological zealots, uh, you know, and add them to the other right wingers who were already on the court. We knew, we knew this was coming. We knew the court was compromised at that point. And we have to just be aware that that, that that part of democracy is completely, it's done. It's sunk. It's Titanic sunk. We, we are in a crumbling democracy at this moment, crumbling to corporate power, cr crumbling to fascism, crumbling to religious ideology. And that is the part that for me is so shocking. I, I told my friend, the other day that uh, if you've ever seen the movie Titanic, where the rich guy, he's got an ascot on and he comes upstairs and he sees that the ship is actually sinking and you can see his face goes like this, like he has like a massive shock. That is what people are going through. That is the shock that I think people are going through. And, and I hope it does more than just wake people up to this particular issue. I hope it wakes people up to the fact that we are really in a fight for democracy. And um, I wish we had all woken up a little bit sooner. Uh, let's move on to the other video, Giancarlo. We have one more. Giancarlo's in the background, pushing buttons, making things happen. God bless him. Uh, <laughs> um. We're going to move on to the other video. There was a guy there. We got, we could show Jocelyn got to talk to this guy. He actually jumped kind of into frame when she was interviewing another female activist down there. So um, let's take a look. But we're worried about all the women. Oh, and wait, I'm going to other people. Forward. She was talking and she was wonderful, but I'm going to go. Yeah. There. Okay, great. To where the guy kind of, you know, it doesn't, it's not affordable. You know, they can't do it. So it's like, if we put those systems in place, you know, Women. I agree, sir. Here he comes. Here he comes. He just jumped in the screen. Are, are you pro choice, I assume? Yes, of course. Okay. I would hey, be it's over not there a given, it okay? It's like a civil war out here. here. You guys can both get in. I'm not trying to. So, are you from New Jersey also? This young. No, I'm from I mean, Jocelyn makes a good point. There are counter protesters. And then they would think we're the counter protest. They were out there reveling and celebrating until, you know, a lot of people came out and uh, were against it. Here we go. Okay. And you drove down? Flew. Flew. Okay. Wow. So we I love it how he said he flew down from Massachusetts and she's like, wow. Because, you know, that takes, she, he, he put a lot of resources into showing up for this. Yeah. I, it sounds like we were all rushing to get back to D.C. When I got the news, I was in New York. I was like, what is I was happening? Really shocked. This, this, the fact There's that word again, shocked. Everybody is using the same word, shocked. Fascism needs to stop. That's it. Simple as that. Instituted in 1973. Right, so this is, we've lived our whole lives being able to take this right for granted. I mean, how does it feel to feel like... Like, uh... You know, just thinking about like all, all of the people who can get pregnant in my life, 
and uh, thinking about what's going to happen to them if, if they're not able to and like what their life's going to look like because a child is such a huge responsibility. It completely changes the way you live your life and, and it makes it so much harder because there's no help for, for people taking care of children. So it's fucking terrifying. Thank you both for being here. I really appreciate it. Are you here with anyone I'd like to else? say one thing. Old white men and legislatures should not be making decisions for women. Are you? I, I'm an old white man. <laughs> don't see that he knows his place. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very upsetting. There's our girl Jocelyn on the street. I thank her for being uh, willing to show up down there and get some of the voices of the people who care about this issue. Um, obviously, we're going to keep covering this. Coming up on the program, not only were people active with their feet, but they were very active across social media platforms yesterday. I picked out a couple of good ones, uh, things that I think make a good point and things that need to be spoken back to. We're going to do that right after this. All right, you're watching Act TV. Here's my Twitter tweets rundown. Uh, the the issue with the Supreme Court and the draft decision around striking down Roe versus Wade it, it lit up the internet as it uh, you would imagine it would. It trended for about two days, and now it's back to people watching Johnny and Amber Heard's trial. I'm sure we're going to watch the actual trial of which this decision, this draft decision, becomes a real decision. We're going to see how that uh, works out. It looks to me, and what I've heard is my understanding is that is going to happen at, in July, right before the Supreme Court goes on their recess, which is, it's, you know, fitting, right? They're just going to. It's like when you fire somebody, you do it on a Friday and then you toss them off to the weekend so that they can calm down. Or if you have to have, uh, you know, uh, a difficult conversation, you do it in public, that kind of thing. Yeah, SCOTUS is going to do it. And then they're going on vacation or break or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, uh, my hypothesis about what happened here is that this leak just turned the midterm elections into a presidential election. And uh, Democrats don't often come out uh, in full force in midterm elections. In fact, no one does. But ideological zealots on the right have started to really take those midterms seriously. And now I think the Democrats will too. So we'll see how it all plays out. Let's take a look at what happened on Twitter. Um, we'll put up the first one, John Carlo. What do we have here? Oh, yeah. So this guy. Actually, let's make it big so they can see it because it's not, it's so tiny. I can't even barely see it with my, there we go. Gen Z is furious and we're ready to vote. Well, where the hell were you? A little extra voting in advance would have been useful. Heidi C comes on the program in a little while to talk about voting in your, when's the last time? Let's all be honest here. I'm going to watch in the comments on the YouTube. When is the last time you voted in a local election that was not connected to the general presidential election or a big election? Anybody? Ah, oh, just this, just this. It's good. Gen Z is furious and we're ready to vote. I'm very happy about that. Uh, I think the fury, had you been paying attention, should have been uh, a little bit sooner or perhaps a lot. Okay, let's move on to the next one. I guess I could do it too. Okay, here's another one. This is from Jack Calfano. If Democrats with trifecta control of the presidency, the House, and the Senate don't pass something defending the right to an abortion right now, I don't know if a single person my age will ever be will ever be bothered to vote for them again. Well, I just had this conversation in the green room with my man, Giancarlo. I, I leave that up, Giancarlo, because in case people are just joining us, they want to see what the hell I'm talking about. Um, I think it's so true. You know, I think it's true that that is how people will see it. And that frustrates me uh, tremendously. Uh, I mean, who is still believing in the electoral system, <laughs> like full on? It's time to go beyond this. It's time to accept, you know, acceptance is part of the grief process that our democracy is uh, eroding and changing. And that is something we have to both accept before we can take 
useful action. You cannot take useful, you can take all kinds of crazy action, but you can't take useful action until you are really aware and accepting of what is going on. I believe there's a thing called the three A's, awareness, acceptance, and action. Acceptance of what's going on doesn't mean you like it. It just means, oh, they're eroding our democracy. And oh, there are still levers of power that come from voting. And oh, both parties are bought out by the same uh, corporate forces that are pushing um, you know, anti-human human agendas. And oh, we should still have to, you know, we, sh we still need to vote. And oh, maybe we'll vote for the party that ha is the least uh, egregious. And oh, then we'll have to push them and keep their feet to the fire in any way you can. You've got one party who just is like, we're fascists and we're cool with that. Yay. Even though we don't have a majority, we're just going to erode voting rights. So it looks like we have a majority and we're going to grab all the levers of power. Then you have the other party who gets in and ha has better social policy, but are still not good. So now we have people running for office. Uh, we have we have the squad and I'm sorry, but you can attack the squad all you want. You can't go in there being an angel and then not get dirtied up by the political process. So I'm kind of pissed at the people on the far left or wherever they are who are just like, let's beat up the squad now because they weren't perfect and they're you had to have a conversation with Nancy Pelosi or whatever. No, they're not going to be perfect, but they're as good as we have right now. So uh, anyway, put that tweet back up, John Carlo, just one second, because I want people to make sure they know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> you need to be bothered to vote no matter what age you are, Jack. You, no, I don't mean Jack, like Jack, like random Jack. I mean, this guy, Jack. I hope none of you all who are watching feel like that. You can make your arguments in the comments at the YouTube and I will pull them up in just a second. Take a look. But um, no, we can't just deny that electoral politics does have its place and staying home to vote is basically handing it over to the fascists. I'm sorry. Don't vote and be like, I voted for the Democrats because they're good. No, vote because it's a strategic um a strategic thing to get closer to your goal while you continue the fight. I think the time of just voting and then laying down is over. And the time of not voting because, oh, well, I'm too good for this. You know, I'm morally superior than this. That time is over too, people. We need to get our freaking hands dirty. Anyway, let's go on. What else do we have here? I can't remember where we're at with the tweet. Oh, we got a great TikTok. This answers a question. Um, I have to say this person who made this TikTok is amazing. And I suggest everyone follow her. Uh, she made this, um, is she just answers a question about that came up earlier, uh, that the activists posed earlier in our earlier segment where they're like, how are they not following the constitution? Well, uh, this person makes a very good argument about how they actually are following the, the people who want to take away our rights are following the intent of the constitution. So let's take a listen to this. You're going to die when you hear this. When I woke up this morning and I read the news of the Supreme Court ruling being leaked to Politico and the idea that Roe v. Wade is most likely going to be repealed in the United States of America, thus taking away the constitutional protection of all American women to get an abortion in their first term, I felt sick. I felt angry. I felt enraged. And I try to make this TikTok, but I don't want to make the TikTok when I'm angry because I lose my ability to be articulate. But I don't think this rage is going away, so I'm going to give you my opinion now. And I apologize if it comes off as aggressive, but I feel aggressive. I love her. So when I read all 98 pages of the report, this is what it boils down to. It boils down, their argument is based on the fact that the Constitution in 1776 and, and, and amendments thus after in no way stood for women's rights to get an abortion. There's no way you can read into it so that the implications of women right, women's rights to get an abortion is founded in the Constitution. And here's the reality. They aren't. 1776, a constitution was written to protect white, rich, property-owning Christian men. Why on God's green earth would we assume that that document is protecting anybody else? And I know there's been amendments, but I don't care. 
Because the foundational governance of that country and where all these laws come from is from a document that is based on owning women and owning African Americans and displacing and committing a genocide against the indigenous population. If we keep looking at that document to be our, our moral meter, we are going to consistently fail. And you want to know proof of why things like CRT is needed? Because somebody in the Supreme Court just looked at a document that was created in, in 1776 and justified taking away women's rights to abortion and control their own bodies. You want to know what I think should happen? You should have done what Jefferson told you to do in 1776. And that's every 20 years you rip up that document because it no longer reflects the society in which you live. Why am I looking to a document to protect me that thought I was property? I could be beat. I could be sexually assaulted and nobody cared. Of course it's not protecting my right to an abortion. It's not protecting anything. It's time we rip it up and start fresh. That's the only way everybody is going to get their constitutional rights protected. I like this person. I don't like the idea of ripping it up and starting fresh, though, because the same people who are outlawing Roe versus Wade are going to want to be part of the fresh constitution. So if they can enshrine their religious zealotry into a constitution we have to deal with, that is problematic. Okay, let me quickly go to uh, what y'all are saying in the chat here. Uh, the private money media, this is from Patricia Longo, the private money media corporations handle the election as a horse race. For us, it's none of our business because there's no government funded media. Well, thanks for watching this show. I appreciate that because we are not a government funded uh, media. Mainstream uh, Anna Ringwald also says MSM, government propaganda and censorship has pretty much nullified federal elections. So true. The propaganda machine is has convinced so many people to vote against their own best interests. In fact, I'm so glad you brought up that point um, because, uh, Anna, because I, I was talking to some relatives who watched the propaganda machine um, and they believe, literally, they literally believe that millions of abortions are happening each day. Less than a million, I think, or maybe a million five, maybe happen across the entire country in a calendar year. But they really believe that because they are believing, you know, the propaganda. So it's weird that, that you know, there's, oh God, I can't even go into it. They're just so bought out. It's, it's practically impossible. We've got, okay, so people are mad because I was like, you know, people will still vote for Dems now. The party must laugh at us. Of course they laugh at us. They're funded by the same big business that other that the other party's funded by. So we still have to deal with that, though. Uh, why the beloved undemocratic party has avoided opportunity after opportunity and people keep supporting them? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, we have to support them. If you ask me my opinion, I don't know if you are, but if you're asking me my opinion, we, we're not supporting Democrats. We're voting for the Democratic Party so that maybe Trump won't trash the place as fast as the Democrats will slowly give us a slide. But we're, I mean, I'm sorry. Yes, someone said something about I'm blaming the voters now. I'm not necessarily blaming the people who are voting, but I'm blaming the American, not blaming, but I think the American public needs to wake up and be like, okay, the Democratic Party also sucks. We need that to put them in power because they're closer to our values and we need to keep pushing and keep doing the other actions of pushing on those levers of power. Organized labor, um, yeah, being out in the street, running for office ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. Making sure the votes are there, volunteering at polls when there is an election. There's a lot that can be done. It's not all lost yet. Oh, okay. So moving over, I just want to say I picked out a whole bunch of good. That was good, right? No, not that. I picked out a whole bunch of great tweets. And um, then I realized this is one uh, website that I love, the other 98 Picked out almost all of the same tweets, and here they are, lucky for, for lucky for us. So this one's from Leah Kohan. If it was about babies, we'd have excellent and free universal maternal health care. You wouldn't be charged a cent to give birth. 
I got a $30,000 bill, by the way. Uh, you wouldn't be charged a cent to give mirth, no matter how complicated your delivery was. If it was about babies, we'd have months and months of parental leave for everyone. If it was about babies, we've had free lactation consultants, free diapers, free formula. If it was about babies, We'd have free and excellent child care from newborns on. If it was about babies, we'd have universal preschool and pre-K and guaranteed after school placements. That's right. So it's exactly not at all about babies. And it's not about life either, because guess what? Women are alive and they could die if you don't let them have an abortion in some areas. Okay, here's the thing, guys. This is from the other 98% directly. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when life begins. It doesn't matter whether a fetus is a human being or not. The entire argument is a red herring, a distraction, a subjective and unwinnable argument that could not matter less. This is helpful in case you wind up having dinner or lunch with some zealot that keeps talking about that. You can take a left based on this great thing that they put out. Nobody has the right to use your body against your will, even to save their life or the life of another person. That's it. That's the full argument. You cannot be forced to donate blood or marrow or organs, even though thousands die every year on waiting lists. They cannot even harvest your organs after your death without your explicit written pre-mortem uh, permission. Denying women the right to abortion means we have less bodily autonomy than a corpse. Oh, yeah. And why would they want that? Because they want to split us apart in every way, not just women, but like they want to split society apart in every way. They, uh, you know, people who are against this think that people who are for it are murderers. Um, and that is not good. Robert Reich says, newsflash, if you outlaw abortions, ban mass magnates, dictate what educators can teach in school and stop people from voting. You're not the party of limited government. Good one. Good one, Robert. Okay, we did that already. Here's a funny one. Reasons why women have abortions. Personal choice, 60%. Not your concern, 10%. Mind your business, 8%. Fuck off, 22%. <laughs> oh, there it is. Let me put it in the center. I love it. Okay. We got a lot. Oh, and there was a lot of talk about vasectomies. Oh, I see the chat is lighting up here. What do y'all think about forcing vasectomies? Stop abortions at the source. Vasectomies are reversible. Make every young man have one when he's de uh, deemed financially and emotionally fit to be a father will be reversed. What's that? Did the idea of regulating a man's body make you uncomfortable? Then mind your fucking business. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a fun one. Fun. We need some fun right now just to open your mind to the idea of you know, unfortunately, I think uh, people are pretty entrenched in their views right now. Is anyone like watching this program with an open mind saying, oh, that's very interesting. Hmm, I think I understand about autonomy. I mean, one of the parts about Twitter that's so uh, disturbing is that it's everybody, as my mom used to say at our Italian dinner table, everybody talking and nobody listening. But I know you are here. I know you are fabulously listening. I have got an interview coming up with Heidi Seek. Thank you for saying. I hope you enjoyed that. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, Heidi Seek is the COO and co-founder of Vote Pro Choice. Um, it's a wonderful organization that encourages people to use the levers of power uh, and, and to make sure that every person running for office from the dog catcher on up. Is the dog catcher the lowest one? I'm not sure. Um, is pro-choice. Even if they're a dog catcher and they're running, you say, are you pro-choice? Because those are the people who obviously move up the ladder. She's been following this issue for decades. She is a very strong advocate for women's rights. She's been active in this movement and others for a long time. Coming up in our interview, uh, we're going to get her take on what's going on and what we can actually do. And the answer isn't just uh, vote. She talks about why, you know, this thing in the Supreme Court isn't the end of the story. And what good, what silver lining may come out of this. So stay tuned. Here she comes. Heidi Seek. <laughs> Okay, coming up is my interview with Heidi Seek. She is from Vote Pro Choice, which is an organization that helps people identify who their pro choice leaders are going to be. Stay tuned for this awesome conversation. I think you're going to like it. Here she comes.
Seek, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to be with you. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking about the rollback of reproductive justice and reproductive rights for uh, quite some time. And, you know, after the email that came from Vote Pro Choice, your organization, the organization that you co founded, said, We knew it was coming. And then went on to, you know, condemn the draft that the Supreme Court is about to make a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Can you talk about the idea that talk about what you're seeing right now in terms of the reaction? We've got tons of people showing up in DC. We've got people outside of their homes. We have people really upset all over the nation. And yet we did know this was coming. I kind of surprised that people didn't know this was coming. Can you can you talk about your thoughts about that? Oh, I have many thoughts about that. And I really appreciate that over the course of the last few years, we've really dived into that discussion here. So now here we are. We did know this was coming. We knew that the possibility of the overturn of Roe v. Wade was imminent. And I appreciate the fact that folks are now aware of what was really at stake. And as we've discussed before, my perspective is a little unique just because I've been working in the reproductive rights community for 30 years, particularly in state abortion clinics and Planned Parenthoods and watching and state legislatures, watching this political strategy unfold over decades. And that's why I think folks wouldn't aren't really clear that this was coming, because not a lot of it, not a lot of people had that perspective because here's the truth. This is a political strategy that was established in the 80s by Reagan and the moral majority and a group of strategists that knew that they had to keep a particular minority of voters around 18 to 20 percent vehemently anti-choice voters with the GOP. The Republican Party in order to win elections. And so they invested in down ballot races, pro, pro protest infrastructure. That's why you see so much of the anti choice protest infrastructure looks all the same. The signs look the same. The talking points look the same. This is an infrastructure investment for this small group of people. And they have been doing that for three decades now. That also includes recruiting judges, placing them, electing state legislatures that are anti-choice, uh, making sure that, that law schools have Federalist Society chapters to get super conservative justices trained and placed into federal benches. And that's just been going on. And, and there's a few of us that have seen it. And the fact is the progressive and democratic ecosystem has not answered that strategy. And so it's hard to see the little down ballot state work, little infrastructure behind the scenes, nefarious power grab, because it's very um, insidious and quiet. And that's by design. Yeah. And I, the media landscape doesn't help with that either. We have the Internet, which most people focus on national issues. They're not necessarily a lot of local news programs on YouTube, for example. And, um, you know, local news has been decimated. And even when it wasn't decimated, I do not remember a lot of coverage of reproductive rights, voting records of local uh, candidates. That's right. And it, it's hard. Exactly right. The demise of local and local media and has been a contribution to this. But it's also the fact is the progressive and democratic ecosystem of which all of your viewers and listeners are a part have truly abdicated reproductive rights to two areas to a bunch of national organizations that focused on abortion rights like planned parenthood and national and NARAL and um and uh, center for reproductive rights that really do focus on federal issues um and they have not been willing to embrace reproductive freedom in their own strategic plans, voting analysis, uh, messaging, their endorsement 
um, questionnaires. And so across the board for many decades, the abdication of the embrace of reproductive freedom in every aspect of our ecosystem has led us to this moment. And I don't know, it could be a million reasons why that's the case. The fact that uh, Democrats or progressives or people just don't like to talk about abortion. They've been shamed by disinformation or the religious infrastructure in this country, the conservative media. They've been shamed into thinking that they shouldn't talk about it. They've been shamed into thinking that we are not a pro-choice nation and we very much are. Mm. And I think I'm very heartened. There are places where I am heartened because some polling data that came out from Perry Undum in February shows us very clearly that 75% of this country, 75% do not want their elected officials making decisions for them about their reproductive health. That is Republicans and Democrats and independent people. And 20% are the are the anti-choice minority that are have oversized power right now. It's very so interesting. Now here we are, right? So here we are. I have some anti-choice relatives, I'm sorry to say, and um, the older ones and the more Catholic ones. And and they are under the impression that they just they've been so propagandized. They're under the impression that a million, a million and a half abortions are happening every day. That's their numbers. Now, where they're getting them, I've seen all kinds of leaflets, propaganda, Fox News, you know, right. the whole nine yards on that end. They're just so full of misinformation that, I mean, it's, they believe that they're in the majority and it's a minority of people. It's It's been a beautiful effort of propaganda to make people believe, even people who are in that 75%, myself, it's like, well, how many of these people are they? Is it 49, 51? Is it, you know, I, you, you just get the sense that it's an overwhelming group that actually does not want this right to stand. And I, I think that is really a genius of, of, of how they've, they've spun this in order to use it electorally to get people to vote against their own best interests. Yes, that's right. And it, and uh, it is it is truly a symptom of the priorities and decisions that a political strategy has made. And we can do that too. The fact is that the Democratic Party and progressive ecosystem did not did not prioritize or strategize properly to protect reproductive freedom for decades. And that's why we're here. So I've been I, seeing a lot of memes saying Hillary Clinton was right about everything. Hillary Clinton was right. And then clipping what she said. And now here we are. Yeah, she was. But but we could have seen we could have seen the writing on the wall. We should have seen the writing on the wall, particularly in 2010 when Barack Obama was elected and a incredible GOP sweep of state legislatures happened. We could have seen the infrastructure then. Uh, and ta and taken some action against it. But also, didn't Barack Obama say the first thing I'm going to do when I get in is codify into law the ability, you know, the choice issue? And then he just basically gave a handout to Wall Street instead. That was his first thing. He let us down. Yeah, but yes. And that's what happens when we look to the federal government to save reproductive freedom. It's never been the place because you have to remember the Supreme Court, all of this, all of the Supreme Court decisions are based on pieces of law, legislation that were passed in state legislatures, all of it. So all the bans, all the disc, all of it. And so why we have not been prioritizing those low, down ballot local elections is, is got to change. And I'm grateful, I'm so grateful to see all of the um, uprising, outpouring, the prioritization of this, because now we're going to see the pro-choice majority in action. Um, it is, I'm sad, I'm very sad that we had to lose so much and we're, we got to this point. Now, of course, you know, this is a draft decision. We, it's unprecedented and historic that this was leaked. Whoever leaked it to me is a huge hero of democracy, um, and and I'm thankful for that. However, we don't have a strategy for how to lobby the Supreme Court. These are six individuals who have a, an extraordinary amount of power, and it's one of the reasons why I was so vehemently opposed to um, all of the appointments that happened in the mo in the recent history. You know, I went in and lobbied against Neil Gorsuch, and then of course I spent a month in D.C 
protesting the uh, nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court because we all knew, those of us who were truly in touch with the reality of the system of oppression that was happening for voting rights and, um, uh, and, and abortion rights, we knew that this was a real watershed moment that um, Brett Kavanaugh, even as a nominee, was a political operative that was going to be on the bench to achieve a particular goal. And one of those goals was to overturn Roe v. Wade. And he is there. He's there. That's why we fought so hard against it. It um, does seem like it's possible there's a silver lining in terms of both activism here around the leaked draft, because it's not a done deal and you do see this uproar. But is there a potential silver lining for this not being, um, you know, something, as you said, that is a Supreme Court law of the land, that is uh, a more local experience do you think it will it will encourage more democracy usually more democracy means more progressive politics is there any silver lining to this politically um, well you know first I or even for reproductive justice is there any yeah there is and there isn't i mean first of all i just want to name that currently right now in the united states of america with roe still in place um, there is a huge challenge of access to reproductive health. So 58% of the country lives in a place hostile to reproductive freedom. Texas has a six-week abortion ban with a vigilante law. O Oklahoma's law just went into a in, uh, in effect yesterday. So there is reproductive oppression happening now in the United States of America. So well, let's name that. And then if this opinion does in whatever form overturn Roe, we're gonna have 27 states that will ban abortion um, instantly, basically. Um, so say July. And that is horrible and traumatizing for so many folks that need access to healthcare. The, and, and there are a lot of elected officials involved in what will be the future criminalization of access to abortion. So I think the silver lining is that that reality is going to come home to people. Uh, it is not, it's no longer privileged white people are protected. Their reproductive health will not be protected. This is already a huge burden on folks with of low income, women of color, people of color, mothers who already have children that and don't want more children to care for because of economic reasons or whatever. That is still a huge, huge issue. And there will be a ton, there will be a lot of suffering as there currently is, particularly also in Texas now and Oklahoma coming. So I am grateful that there is an awakening. I am grateful that people are now going to have personal experience for what it, what reproductive oppression will feel like. And I am grateful that hopefully it will change folks' behavior about where they give money, how they act politically, whether they vote. And we have every indication to think that that will be the case. I'm particularly obsessed with those local, or local elections that are in those 27 states where Roe will be banned or Roe will be, or well, abortion will be banned. Because think about all of the power that you have as a city council person, a mayor, a district attorney, a public defender, a judge, a sheriff. You, if you are a pro-choice district attorney or a sheriff in those states, you have a lot of power to be able to protect reproductive freedom by not criminalizing people's decision to exercise their body autonomy. So I'm very hopeful that young people and progressive people will step into these local elections and run for office and take leadership. And that's what we're seeing. Well, I hope so. I think, I mean, we're seeing that already about cer certain other issues, but hopefully this will just drive the point home. I'm thinking ahead about, you know, it's, I hate to even talk about sort of the political ramifications of this, the politics of it, when it actually is so tangible to women's lives. Women's lives are on the line here. You have an ectopic pregnancy and you can't have an abortion. You're possibly going to die. What if yep. you can't make it from central Texas to California or wherever it's still legal? You know, this is this is not a joke. And and so I hate to, I don't want to just bring it to the political level because it does seem to abstract it from the the bloody and the flesh and blood issue that we're talking about here, which I think is why it's so shocking that 
that the, our Supreme Court could say, eh, we don't care if you die. They're basically saying that. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, people who are able to be pregnant are the most extremely marginalized human beings now in the country. They're, the, the, the federal government is saying that people who can be pregnant, women, trans people, non-binary people, they are not, their lives are not important that it is a, a, a broader aspect of misogyny and sexism that prevails. White supremacy and the systems of oppression is more important than the human beings. So that is very, um, very, very troubling for sure. But you know, the, the fact is political strategy got us here and political strategy is what's gonna get us out. So the solution is twofold, absolutely threefold really. Absolutely, we do need to be giving um, support and donations to abortion funds in areas where people do not have access. That has to be just part of our new giving strategy and where we are able to be of service. Um, there are um, incredibly important uh, access points for self-managed abortion, medication abortion, travel funds, that kind of thing, so that people can get to the 17 states that are projecting, that are going to be uh, protecting abortion services now in this country. Um, the second part is political. So yeah, we've been looking to the federal government to codify Roe v. Wade and federal legislation. They tried that last couple months ago in passing the Women's Health Protection Act. We don't have the votes. We also have Democratic Party um, support for anti-choice Democrats in two congressional yeah. elections right now, one in Texas and one in North Carolina, where we have two pro-choice women of color running in that primary with the Democratic Party not supporting those women, which also happened in Chicago with Marie Newman versus Dan Lipinski. We have to stop that. We must stop that. Stop. Um, we have to obviously support, uh, push for filibuster reform, court expansion, all of that as we talked about federal solutions. But honestly, we can get so much more uh, value out of our investment by focusing on our state legislatures and our local elections. You, If you give ec however much you give to a congressional campaign or a national organization, your impact for a state legislative race of a pro-choice champion is like tenfold. These budgets for these races can be like $15,000 or $20,000 for the entire race. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really a, a possible if you if you invest in those races. They're not sexy, they're not fun. They're likely your neighbor down the street that's running for these state legislative races, but guess what? They could not be more important. They are so important. So run for office yourself or figure out who the hell is and make sure that you're giving money and and working on those campaigns before you work on anything that's more shiny and bright. It does seem like the upcoming elec election of, okay, I don't know if that was thunder or something else, but if the lights go out, I'll tweet about it, whatever. All uh, right. Okay. <laughs> um, so excuse me for that. Um, I've heard it said that 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 this issue, that this, um, you know, the drop of this uh, document right. has just yeah. made the, the upcoming election basically into a presidential election and that we're likely to see people um, come out and vote, even though it's a midterm election. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, yes. OK, so number one, um, we vote pro choice has been um, building the a voter guide, a national voter guide. We've done in six elections, and I, we've done a bunch of primary voter guides. We're now the largest voter guide program in the country because people are desperately yearning for information on the races through the lens of reproductive freedom. So I can tell you this momentum has been building. Now, before this decision, roughly about thirty percent of the electorate that's democratic or progressive would say that they voted on abortion rights, which is a big chunk of people. Those are really the folks that NARAL Planned Parenthood would mobilize in a federal election or even any kind of election. Now, what Planned Parenthood's research is showing that that, that 
um, number of voters who are mobilized by reproductive freedom in their voting behavior before this decision was increased by, I think, 12 to 20 percent. So I can imagine that now it's pretty much everybody. And that's what I'm seeing from all of the organizations and the, and the elected officials who are issuing statements about this is the most important thing ever. Well, you know, uh, sad, I wish they had been around for the last 25 years, like promoting that. Mm -hmm. But now more than ever, it's going to be critical. And I absolutely uh, believe in my own heart, as well as what we're seeing in the polling data, that this will absolutely be a mobilizing issue. Is this the nail in the coffin for Susan Collins? Are we done with her <laughs> now? Can we just can we just excuse I, her from the table? You know, <laughs> here's the this is the thing. Um, I am done with federal elected officials providing lip service to reproductive freedom and not taking action. I'm just done. I've I've been done for years, but. Um, it's just, it's, it, again, it's on us that we keep looking to the federal, the federal government to try to protect reproductive freedom. They actually stopped doing that in about 2010 when the ACA was passed, um, making, re reiterating the Hyde Amendment, which is no federal funds will go to abortion. Because the fact of the matter is the Hyde Amendment's been around since 1970 something after Roe v. Wade was decided, which has prevented people on Medicare, Medicaid, and in the, in the um, armed services from accessing abortion care. And these are the people that need it the most. So it's like the federal government has never been a champion of reproductive freedom ever. And we keep looking there for that to be the solution. It has never been the solution. So now we got to change our perspective. Like who cares about Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski and, and it, all of that, we got to look to the folks that are doing the work on the ground now. So interesting. I, I appreciate you coming on because you really undo what not only are the talking points from the right around this issue, but also the the general understanding of like, oh, we need the Supreme Court in order to have these, you know, this this federal leg not yeah. legislation, I mean, but in order to have this law. It's and I, to all of the folks watching, I'm not saying that we cannot strongly, we must strongly be pressuring the president of the United States for doing a whole of government approach for using every every lever in the federal government's uh, tool chat, toolbox to be able to provide um, reproductive freedom access. Mm -hmm. And that can be through the Department of Health and Human Services. It can be through their own insurance programs. There's federal employees across the country in every state and territory of this nation. So we can figure out all kinds of innovative ways to support and protect reproductive freedom through those directions. Joe Biden and the Biden Harris <laughs> administration needs to be doing that. They need to be doing that. Um, they need to be pressing for filibuster reform. We need to elect two more senators in the midterms. Absolutely. No Democratic money should ever go to an anti-choice Democrat congressperson ever, ever again, never. We have to make sure it's in the party platform strong and that we're adhering to it fully. We need to embrace our, prior, our nation's pro-choice majority. And we need to be investing more in the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. We need to be doing more local elections. We need to be doing both. So the time is now. It, Even though we saw this coming, um, just if you don't mind me asking you a personal question, how did this affect you when you got the news of the leaked memo? Well, I, as we've talked about over the years, I absolutely knew this was coming. It was very frustrating for me to have so many conversations over the years with um, highly educated, progressive Democrats who were who would say things like, John Nov Roberts will never let this happen. They're not going to overturn Roe. And the fact is, I've been watching the slow burn for 30 years. And anyone who's on the ground, particularly reproductive justice organizations and women of color and folks working in independent clinics and local clinics, they have been telling us this for years. We know. We know. So for me, it was not a surprise. It was uh, there was part of me that felt quite vindicated in that um, I'm I'm very tired of being told that this wasn't really going to happen when I knew in my heart that it would. Mm -hmm. Sexism and misogyny is manifested itself in many different forms. We saw it in 2016, and now we see how powerful it really is. The Supreme Court of the United States of America is willing to completely uh, abandon precedent and the the 
principles of the legal and justice system that this country was founded on in order to oppress people's reproductive choices. So that is what the reality is now. And so for me, it was like, okay, now you believe me. And I was, a, I, I was mostly upset because Vote Pro Choice had a certain, had a, we're ready. We were getting ready. We were preparing for the decision in June. We knew the, we knew that something like this would happen and that we had a bunch of plans to be ready for that. And it came a little early, but that's fine. We're good to go. We have our voter guide program. We have amazing down ballot candidates that we're supporting who are our heart and soul. Just follow all of them on Twitter. You will see what a pro-choice champion looks like and you will see what the solution to this problem is gonna be. There are incredible people at the local level that are fired up and ready to fight and they're they will continue to do so. I'm glad to see, hear that and I'm very glad to hear and to really see the, um, this just people out in the street. I think the shock of it um, is actually maybe going to be very useful and i i do agree that that the person who leaked this this document is is a is a hero um yeah because if it was going to be a case they would talk about it and maybe it would roll it back and maybe they would and people would be getting prepared for possible maybe and then there would be this slow emotional slide into something terrible whereas just hearing it today when yesterday we were still talking about i don't know the war covid some other thing um I think that might have been just sort of the ticket to wake people up to say, hey, uh, you're losing your democracy quick. It's time. Mm -hmm. It's time. And listen, this decision, um, there was a lot of people that thought that, including the reproductive rights coalitions and rights, health and justice coalitions who were planning for different scenarios. We thought that John Roberts might prevail in just kind of getting it rolled back from the Roe v. Wade protections around 24 to 26 weeks to 15 weeks. We thought maybe he'd be successful in that. We thought it would be um, kind of a murky uh, decision that would kind of turn it all over to the state. So we'd have a bunch of patchwork decisions that were being made by attorneys general. But here's the thing, the Justice Alito's decision was so clear and egregious. It was like, this needs to go, we're overturning it. It couldn't be more clear. And it's the tip of the iceberg for other rights. Like this is this is stunning about- This is what's really like, scary, yeah. Real, that's, what's this, that's what's extremely scary, that um, these are folks that are absolutely willing to take away our body autonomy, our privacy, We're, they're going to go after, they could go after marriage equality, they could go after all sorts of things, birth control access. I mean, you know, there is a universe where this is merely a stepping stone to the ultimate um, strategy, which is a national abortion ban. Hmm. And we're certainly thinking that that is what the goal is here. We certainly know Clarence Thomas and Alito are very much in favor of this. And we could you could see it in the little nuances of the decision, um, the breadcrumbs that were being written in that regard. And that is um, that's where, you know, we got to really step up our game. Well, Heidi, thank you so much for being here with us. I always appreciate your insights. I appreciate all the work you're doing. It's not a secret that ACT TV and Vote Pro Choice are sort of uh, sister cool. fellow organizations. So um, it's always nice to know that I can have someone of your caliber come on uh, and inform and 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 give people something to do with their action. Of course, you want to go oh, uh, yeah. to Vote Pro Choice, which is a hashtag you can follow everywhere. Uh, final word, Heidi. Yes, again, the elections are so important, but you know, we're all looking at the 538 congressional seats um, that are that we think are the ones that we have to focus on. Guess what? There's like 70,000 other races on the ballot across many states this cycle and future cycle. So those are the ones we really have to look at. And I, I joined the town council in my local neighborhood. Oh, yes. And, um, they, so they're they're having the um the state yes. state uh whatever it is the convention this weekend and so everyone's been calling me hello Juliana this is so and so for treasurer and I think of you all the time because yes. you're the one who taught me to say um wh wh where do you stand on reproductive reproductive rights and reproductive freedom yes. and they're like well sometimes they'll hedge you know I'm the treasurer and we don't and I say I said uh 
you may be the treasurer now, but I don't know where you're going in your political career. And uh, I need to know this is very important. And they're kind of stunned. So uh, yes. letting it begin with me, as you have suggested. Every single elected office, every single one has a role to play in protecting reproductive freedom. We do have a report about that local impact report that lays out every single elected office and what they, begin to, they can do to protect or expand reproductive freedom, even the treasurers. So the treasurers, we've had pro-choice comptrollers in the city of New York who have allocated city funds to expanding reproductive freedom. It, it's very important. Every single elected office, and we're going to make sure that every, every voter has the information they need to be able to cast their ballots through that lens. So very important. And thank you for your service. Perfect. Oh, That's you perfect. are welcome. And I learned from you. So thank you very much for telling me and for telling the audience just exactly what we can do. Um, and I do want to thank you for your measured approach here today. We're all kind of maybe shocked and sad, but I am noticing on the internet a lot of just sort of emotionally laden appeals uh, for, and that's putting it mildly. Um, and I do think we have to keep our, keep our heads on straight if we want to win and if we want to press forward with, uh, you know, justice in this area for, for people who can become pregnant and become mothers. That's right. That's right. And that's the entire core strategy of what we've been doing at Vote Pro Choice for many years and what I've been doing in my career. So I appreciate that we're able to have that um, conversation about the reality. Um, that's what, what's most important. So I'm looking forward to all of your viewers and all of the political, the progressive democratic ecosystem to be prioritizing reproductive freedom and all of their work. Yeah, me too. And we'll keep pushing to make that happen. Thank you so much, Heidi. I really appreciate you coming on Thank today. You. Thank you. Thanks. Good stuff. I hope we helped you process everything that's going on as we do here on ACT TV next week. Well, we've got a lot coming up. I like to hit the breaking news, so you never know what's going to hit between now and then. But I do have some cool things planned for you. I have a criminologist coming on that I'm going to interview. Uh, he's just written a book about how Trump should be actually, how Trump should fit into the history of crime. And uh, I have a personal uh, interest in um, organized crime, not personal, but I just, you know, being an American of Italian descent, we always get told that we're part of the mob. So we wind up knowing a lot about the mob. Um, and Trump, mob, Trump, you know, I think we can make the connection and this guy might actually just do that. I also have an interview planned with Dr. Harriet Fraud. We're going to talk more about, it's kind of jumping off from this place. We're going to talk more about the oppression of women for capitalist purpose across, you know, the, the decades and even in, into deeper history. She is a feminist, a psychotherapist, and always someone to have that kind of longer in-depth conversation with that I, that I so value. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks for all the comments on YouTube and all the comments on Facebook. Somehow I only have the one phone, so I wind up responding to the comments on YouTube, but I will work on it so that I can get to y'all on Facebook too. I will see you soon. My name is Juliana Forlano. Follow me on Twitter, follow ActTV across platforms, and I will see you next week.